Well, so uh, good morning to everyone in the US and good evening to all of you in Japan and good afternoon to all of you from around the world. So uh, we are delighted to welcome you uh, to our event titled The COVID-19 Pandemic, Human Rights and Public Health in Japan and the United States. My name is Kunimitsu Mamiya, Director of the US Japan Research Institute. It is our great honor to welcome Ms. Alicia Eddie Yaming as a moderator, and uh, uh, Dr. Eriko Sase and uh, Dr. Tokuko Munesue as panelists. It is our great honor to welcome, uh, sorry, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Alicia Eddie Yaming is uh, uh, currently senior fellow at the Petroleum from Center of Health Law Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics at the Harvard Law School, and senior advisor on human rights and at Partners in Health. Next, uh, Dr. Eriko Sase is a health scientist and a member of Lancet Commission on the Value of Death. She is an um, a fellow and researches justice uh, in end of life care. She is a, a visiting researcher in the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University, adjunct faculty in the Graduate School of Medicine at the University of Tokyo, a visiting professor at the Saitama Prefecture University, and the director at the Global Health Research Center of Japan. And then uh, Dr. Tokuko Munesue is a professor at the Faculty of Social Sciences of Waseda University in Japan. Her specialist areas are social security law and international human rights law, in particular health and human rights. So uh, Ms. Yaming, could you please get started as a moderator? Thank you very much, Kuni. It's a great honor to be here and to be able to moderate this important discussion. Um, I wanted to start by acknowledging what day this is, uh, because it's an important day both for Japan and for the United States. It's exactly 19 years since the 9-11 attacks in the United States, and it's nine and a half months since the Fukushima disaster. And I say that for two reasons. The first is that memory in human rights is extremely important. It's the way we preserve a relationship with those who have died. Uh, it is uh, an ethical obligation to remember not just how they died, but actually why they died, including the responsibility of governments. Um, and the second reason is that both of those events triggered were emergencies and they triggered uh, government reactions in policy and uh, government agendas to change policy, including in Japan, uh, efforts to uh, centralize and reform the constitution and many, many changes in the United States that will come up in our discussions. So I do want to situate this discussion in that, in the acknowledgement of what a meaningful day this is. Uh, we have two great panelists. Um, the, first pa the first presentation will be on international legal frameworks on public health emergencies and the human rights situation in Japan. And, oh, sorry. And the second, the second, because I may not have a chance to say it later, will be on human rights and public health uh, in the COVID pandemic, protecting people and healthcare capacity in the United States. And after both of the panelists speak, I will make a few uh, remarks and then we'll have time to open it to a Q&A. Okay, so can you show my PowerPoint? Okay. Hello everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to present my research work. I'm Tokuko Munisue from Western University in Japan. I have conducted research on health and human rights, including a topic about discrimination on the basis of health stages. So today, I'm presenting on the international legal framework on public health emergency and the human rights situation and the challenges in Japan. Mm -hmm. 
Here, uh, here are the contents of this presentation. First, I will explain briefly the international legal framework on public health emergencies. Second, I will demonstrate why the human rights-based approach is so important and necessary for COVID-19 response. Then I will talk about the human rights situation in Japan, focusing on discrimination against patients at risk populations and their family members. Finally, I will point out some of the challenges to human rights in Japan. To start, I will I would like to talk about the international legal framework on public health emergencies. The most important international legal framework on public health emergencies related to human, human rights is International Health Regulations, IHL, of the World Health Organization. The IHL are uh, an instrument of international law that is legal, legally binding on 196 countries, including the 194 WHO member states. The IHL provides an overarching legal framework that defines countries' rights and obligations in handling public health emergency, as well as outlining the criteria to determine whether or not a particular event constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. Regarding the characteristic of the IHL, Professor Lawrence Gostin, uh, Gostin pointed out that the IHL crafts a delicate balancing dynamic of health security, trade, and human rights, entailing difficult trade offs among the three interests. That is, the IHL balances not only health with trade, but also health with human rights. Article 3 of the IHL provide that state party must have full respect for the, uh, for the dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms of persons, guided by the UN Charter and the WHO Constitution. The IHL also have universal application for the protection of all people of the world. The IHR also requires state party to protect the right of travelers as well as ensure the informed consent, transparency, and non-discrimination in the uh, appli uh, application of health measures under the regulations. The isolation, uh, quarantine, and other measures which the government takes in order to respond to a pandemic of infectious diseases may limit people's rights and freedoms, such as freedom of movement, the right to uh, physical integri integrity, and the right to privacy. In this regard, Article 57, Paragraph 1 of the uh, I IHL um, stipulates that the IHL and other relevant international agreements should be interpreted so as to compatible and the provision of the IHL shall not affect the rights of rights and obligation of any state party deriving from other international agreements. Therefore, I will talk about the relationship with international human rights treaties with the US and Japan ratified. Both countries ratify the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, and there are limitation provision in the ICCPR. For example, Article 21 provides the right of peaceful assembly and mentions that no restrictions may be placed on the ex exercise of these rights other than those imposed in conformity with the law and the future necessary in democratic society in the interest of the protection of public health. Thus, state parties may limit certain rights and freedoms under certain conditions. However, these limitations are not permitted without any restriction. The strict principle on the limitation and the derogation provisions in the ICCPR is an important interpretive in instrument on these limitation provisions. The principles state that 
Uh, limitations shall be provided for by law based on and proportionate to a legitimate objective strictly necessary in democratic society, the least restrictive measures available and not arbitrarily, unreasonable or discriminatory. The principles also mention that public health may be ground for limiting certain rights in order to allow the state to take measures dealing with a serious threat to the health of the populations. And these measures must be specific, specifically aimed, to, aimed at preventing disease and injury and providing health care. Then I would like to talk about why human rights-based approach is so important and necessary for a COVID-19 response. According to the COVID-19 guidance of Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, respect for human rights across the spectrum will be fundamental to the success of the public health response and the recovery from the pandemic. The reason why is that the virus does not discriminate, but its impacts do. In a public health emergency, the degree and the type of negative impacts vary among people depending upon existing vulnerability and socioeconomic status. Public health emergency exacerbates such uh, susceptibility in many cases. In addition, the instability and fear that the pandemic engenders is exacerbating existing human rights concerns such as discrimination against certain groups, hate speech, xenophobia, and so forth. A human rights-based approach is a powerful conceptual framework that foc uh, focuses on the right of vulnerable and discriminated people. Observing the crisis and its impact through a human rights lens puts a focus on how it is affected people on the ground, particularly the most vulnerable, and what can be done about it. We need to assess and address the human rights impact among vulnerable people and discrimination against the, the infected and at-risk populations. The regarding the uh, human rights situation in Japan, while there are countries that take strict regulations, limited people's rights and freedoms, the Japanese government takes relatively less strict uh, regulations that request people self restraint But such less strict regulations also have significant social economic impact on people's life and livelihood. And it is reported that a lot of workers, especially non labor employed and self-employed or freelancers, as well as single mothers workers, have been forced to change their employment status or take a leave and a decrease in income. In addition, discrimination against patients, at-risk populations, and their family member is a more serious pro problem in the Japanese community with strong peer pressure. In Iwate Prefecture, uh, where the first case was confirmed at the end of July, the company uh, which the patients worked for received a lot of slandering phone calls and emails and the company's server went down. In Shimane Prefecture, where well, almost 100 high school students who belonged to the football club were infected, the high school received a lot of phone calls uh, which criticized and surrounded the school and the students. The students were also criticized at, and their face photos were distributed on the internet and the social media. False information has also has been distributed on the internet and the social media, and the a restaurant in Mie Prefecture forced to be closed due to such false information. Furthermore, discrimination against health professionals has been extremely serious. It has been reported that there have been a lot of discriminatory cases against health professionals and their family members. For example, 
There have been cases of refusal, refusal to enter into taxis, to enter restaurants, and to see doctors. There are some cases that health professionals' children have been refused to attend nursery school. The children were, ch children were uh, bullied and isolated at school, as well as family members suspended from work. The piece of, in, uh, of information on discrimination, which I just mentioned, were by media, uh, labor unions, association of health professionals, and some municipalities. But the number uh, and extent of the human rights violation cases, which have been identified, has been very limited as of yet. It is necessary to monitor human rights violations and the human rights negative impact of all vulnerable groups nationwide. In this regard, the Japanese government has set out a new working group on prejudice, discrimination, and privacy under the uh, novel coronavirus uh, expert meeting of cabinet secretariat and the first meeting held on the September 1st. The aim of the working group is to investigate the actual situation of prejudice and discrimination and violations and uh, violations of the right to privacy. It would be a great progress as well as a great opportunity to introduce, introduce the methodology of human rights impact assessment into the government's investigations and policy assessment. NGOs and the research groups also play a critically important role to monitor and address the human rights situation and impact. In order to develop monitoring, the monitoring and assessment abilities of civil society uh, regarding health issues, I would like to propose to set up Health and Human Rights Research Center as a platform of lawyers, health professionals, policy makers, and the civil society in Japan. Another challenge to human rights is to amend, uh, to amend the relative legislation. The Act on the Prevention of Infectious Diseases and Medical Care for Patients with Infectious Diseases, the mentions in this preamble about the past uh, discrimination against patients suffering from leprosy and AIDS, and Article 2 stipulates the full respect to the human rights. Also, uh, act on special measures against countermeasures against novel influenza uh, also provide uh, respect to the human rights. However, uh, there is no provision uh, to take measures to respond to discrimination and to protect and support the victims in both acts. As previously mentioned, discrimination against patients and sufferers is a serious problem in Japan, and it is necessary to develop the legal system to prohibit discriminatory treatment and protect and support the victims. Recently, there are some municipalities, such as Tokyo, Nagasaki, Gifu, Tottori, and Okinawa that have amend amended their ordinances on measures against COVID-19 in order to prohibit discriminatory treatment and surrendering against patients and so on. This movement in some municipality uh, would contribute to develop the legal system, central and other local governments, and it is necessary to continue to pay attention to the movements and its applications. There are many other challenges, but I would like to finish my presentation here. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Tokuko, for your insightful presentation. My name is Eriko Sase. I would like to thank the USJI and Professor Mamiya for hosting today's webinar. I also would like to thank Professor Yami and Professor Munisue for constructive discussion for preparation of this webinar. 
I also would like to thank the audience, including the frontline workers, for your devotion. In my presentation, entitled Human Rights and Public Health in the COVID-19 Pandemic, Protecting People and Healthcare Capacity, First, from health science point of view, I will review the COVID-19 situations in three areas. One, in human health, by identifying at-risk populations. Second, impacts on healthcare systems. Third, impacts on health, human rights. Then, I will draw some considerations for a way forward from medical lens, public health lens, and human rights lens. For the country, I will focus on the United States, whose new cases and deaths are the highest in the world. If you allow me, I will turn off my video to secure my internet stream. Let us review the impacts of COVID-19 on human health. The United, United States have over 6.3 million cases and nearly 200,000 deaths. As indicated in yellow, the confirmed cases are 2.8 times higher among Native Americans, African Americans, and Hispanics. And for hospitalization, five times higher among Native Americans and nearly five times among African Americans and Hispanics. For deaths in red, more than two times higher in African Americans. A human is not a host just a host of virus, but also a person influenced by socioeconomic status, education, culture, and so forth. The COVID-19 pandemic deepened the existing health disparities and inequalities among the people who are already experiencing a disproportionate burden of health-related problems. Now, underlying health conditions. When we look at them, People who have three or more conditions, such as obesity or chronic kidney disease, are at risk of hospitalization five times or higher than those who do not have such conditions. Both hospitalizations, hospitalizations and death are much higher among older adults aged 65 years and over, compared to those aged 18 to 29 years. In particular, the likelihood of dying from COVID-19 dramatically increases to 90 times or higher among older adults, as shown in red circle. More than 68,000 residents and workers died at nursing homes. In some states, eight of 10 COVID-19 deaths occurred at nursing homes, averaging over four out of 10. Such tendency has been seen in other countries, such as in Italy. The statistics help us identify at-risk populations for COVID-19. Now let us review the COVID-19 impacts on healthcare systems, particularly when care provision is limited due to the pandemic. Arizona is one of the hardest hit states by COVID-19. As the new cases rose, hospitalization and deaths also increased. The state of Arizona ordered refrigerated trucks to store the dead bodies while requesting out-of-state healthcare workers to assist their hospitals. On June 29, the state of Arizona activated the crisis standards of care as the first case in the United States history. The standards apply to not only due to COVID-19 patients, but also all people in Arizona. Crisis standards of care is a framework for our systems approach as a crisis surge response. 
During the crisis, a focus of care provision shifts from individual patients to the good of the community. The Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, or ASPR, in the Department of Health and Human Services requested the former Institute of Medicine to develop a guidance that state and local public health officials can use. They developed five key elements in 2010 that are, number one, a strong ethical grounding. Number two, integrated and ongoing community and provider engagement, education and communication. Number three, assurance regarding total legal authority and environment. Number four, clear indicators, triggers, and lines of responsibility. Number five, evidence-based clinical processes and operations. Under scarce resource conditions, these standard of care should apply in disasters, both natural and man-made, according to the guidance. A systematic review reported that crisis standards of care was identified in 29 states. All incorporate so far scores that assesses the performance of organ systems. 15 states consider long-term comorbidities, five consider pregnancy, and 10 consider prioritizing essential worker status. We must note that before the crisis standards of care was activated, some doctors in Arizona had to send COVID-19 patients home because all their ventilators were in use at the hospital based on the media interview. It indicates that access to care is already limited when a surge of patients overwhelms hospital capacity with or without crisis standards of care. So far, I have not obtained evidence of utilization of crisis standards of care in Arizona. Yet, how crisis standards of care may affect certain groups of people should be carefully monitored in any states. There are some concerns raised in use of crisis standards of care during the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, Boston-based physicians warned in the New England Journal of Medicine that crisis standards of care deprioritize people with coexisting conditions or with higher likelihood of death within five years, penalize pe people for having conditions rooted in historical and current inequalities. Another newly published study by Harvard researchers, for example, found significant associations between a high rate of COVID-19 and socioeconomic status and citizen status that limits education and income level, which may result in crowded housing with older adults. Health and human rights have three relationships. First, for instance, public health policies affect on human rights. Second, violation of human rights impact on health. Third, promotion and protecting health and promotion and protecting human rights are profoundly linked. From what we reviewed, we can say that all three relationships of health and human rights are demonstrated in the COVID-19 pandemic. To reduce COVID-19 patients, we need more evidence about the characteristics of the virus and understand the transmission pathways as my co-authors I summarize in their publication. We also need to know how human, humans as hosts respond to the virus, such as symptoms, comorbidity, recovery process, and long-term consequences. Given the knowledge, we need to take actions to prevent infection and spread of the virus because there is no established medicine or vaccine for COVID-19. A public health preventive approach is effective measures such as social distancing or physical distancing 
which is not a new measure. It's been already used for other infectious diseases. Personal protective equipment and personal hygiene, such as hand washing. Protecting health of individuals lowers the number of new cases and hospitalization. Therefore, secure healthcare capacity. It reduces death by COVID-19 and other diseases in the end. The National Academy of Sciences made a guideline for crisis standards of care for the COVID-19 pandemic. The report made an emphasis of securing and training staffing, among other preparation necessary for health systems and space, such as hospital beds. The World Health Organization affirmed the right to the highest attainable standard of health or the right to health in the constitution. The concepts such as health for all and health promotion were developed. Indicators are often used to achieve the right to health. Increasing availability in funct functioning public health and healthcare facilities, goods and services and programs in sufficient quantity. Accessibility promotes them to be accessible to everyone. Acceptability requires them to be respectful of medical ethics and culturally appropriate and sensitive to gender and life cycle requirements. Quality requires them to be scientifically and medically appropriate and of good quality. The right to health is stipulated in one of the key human rights treaties the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, ratified by 170 member states. The United States has not ratified this treaty. However, these indicators are not limited for the use of the ratified countries. Promoting human rights by realizing availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality of healthcare services would benefit both patients and the public. In fact, other treaties that the United States has ratified contain provisions related to health or the right to life. In a book, Advancing the Human Rights to Health, published by the Oxford University Press, we took part in writing chapters. Professor Yemi, today's moderator, emphasized in her great chapter on the United States, participation of all state holders, government responsibility to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights, and accountability and transparency of government and private sectors are also essential. Our recent history teaches us that emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases will infect humans, as did SARS, H1N1, Ebola virus disease, Zika, and forthis. Turning on our eyes to the environment, the wildfire in West Coast is record-breaking. An extremely active hurricane season is expected this year. A pandemic combined with natural disasters can put a heavy burden on people and healthcare systems. We must prepare by using evidence with a medical lens, preventing measures by a public health lens, and guaranteeing equal opportunity for all people by a human rights-based approach. It will help us to achieve what the United Universal Declaration of Human Rights stated, all human beings are born equal in dignity and rights, even in challenging times. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Erica. I, 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 I guess now um, I'm not sure what the camera is doing, but I guess uh, I will make a few remarks on uh, with respect to both Takuko's and Erica's uh, presentations. 
And I really think uh, the important thing to take from this is what are the differences and what are the similarities between Japan and the United States? Um, one stunningly obvious difference is that there are about 1,400 deaths in Japan. And as Erica said, there are almost 200,000 in the United States. Um, but I think we can break it down a little bit more. Um, and I'll start with a few reflections on uh, Takuko's talk, which he started with the international health regulations, which were significantly revised after the SARS epidemic. So we now have a 2005 version of the international health regulations. And it strikes me that they have been largely totally sidelined in COVID-19 and need to be significantly revised yet again to deal with, in fact, some of the things that Erica brought up, that there we are facing climate cataclysm. We're facing other kinds of crises that are not infectious diseases that are included in the IHR. Um, we also need a dispute resolution mechanism because the IHR clearly works better before a crisis, before in, in identifying information sharing in a public health emergency of international concern, and it has been a dismal failure subsequently. Um, so there's a question about why that is, why global health governance is so anemically feeble and has been such a failure in this time. And then I think there's also a question in Takugo's presentation, um, which she very carefully set out the Syracuse principles, which allow for derogation from international human rights treaties. And, uh, and I have to say that uh, at Harvard Law School, together with the Versoffen blog in Europe, we did a comparative legal analyses of approximately countries that cover approximately 80% of the population of the world and found actually that the countries that had made formal derogations um, under their treaty obligations were no more or less likely to respect human rights than other countries that had not, but were committed internally because of democratic controls. Um, so that is also a question about the meaningfulness and, uh, and role that the international human rights system plays. But I think the main question about the Syracuse principles, and I think here there is a similarity between Japan and the United States, which Takuko brought out, the, the, the restrictions in Japan, which is a unitary state as opposed to the federalist state that we have in the United States, and that's very important in law. We like to think a lot about who decides jurisdictional questions. But nonetheless, in Japan, the, the, there has been, as she emphasized, a lot of self-restraint. Uh, Compliance is not uh, penalized. It's not, um, there are not the same kind of mandated restrictions that we have seen and strong, strict lockdowns that we have seen elsewhere. And of course, in the United States, you could say that there has been an entirely symbolic, ineffective, uh, non-presence of the federal government that we now know was deliberate malfeasance and not just negligence. Um, so I think there's a question about the law, not when um, certain state action, when rights limit or regulate the ability of states to take restrictive action, but there is also a question about when when inaction needs to be um, uh, challenged or governments need to be made accountable for inaction. Um, and certainly that's the case in the United States and probably um, many would argue in Japan that there's also some element of that. Um, so, Another issue that came up in both presentations uh, was differential impacts on different populations. Um, 
and uh, it, and especially clearly in the presentation that Erico gave of the radically different rates of COVID-19 among racial and ethnic um, uh, minorities and in congregate settings. Um, we don't have as much data from the presentation on Japan, but I think we can uh, extrapolate some from Erico's presentation that, um, you know, the health system in this, first of all, there is not much of a health system in the United States. That is a major difference. Japan has universal health coverage. It has a, a national public health system. The United States does not. The United States has a bunch of private hospital networks and zero investment in public health. And we have rued those decisions in how it has played out in this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so, I, I, but I do think the data on disparities shows very clearly how the way we treat public health and health care um, has an enormous implication on the, the, the management of difference in a democratic state, right? Just as we see in the United States, all of these um, uh, protests about racial violence from the police, for example. And we understand that the criminal justice system is a, a, an institution that shows that young men of color in particular, although young women as well, are not really fully members of US society. Systematically, through our policing system and our criminal justice system, the health system that we have, the health, loosely defined health system that we have set up in this country, over and over again, long before COVID, as Erico noted, uh, shows that people of color, and in this case, probably before COVID, it was more women of color because of their socially constructed caregiving roles and roles in reproduction that felt their non-inclusion in US society through the healthcare system. That's why long before COVID, we had maternal mortality ratios among women of color that were four times as high as, as white women. We had disparities in child mortality that are greater now than pre-Civil War. So those, to me, suggest that it's not enough to treat one disease at a time. These are structural issues baked into U.S. society that are then expressed through the health system just as they are through other social institutions in our society. So the health system or lack thereof acts as a kind of uh, social determinant of health, if you will, right? So that when people lo lost their jobs in massive waves in the United States, they also lost their employment-based insurance. That does not happen, largely does not happen in Japan, for example. Um, so that is a major, major difference, but also similarities in disparities. I don't know enough to say what are the, dis what are the most discriminated populations to whom um, Takuko was referring. I do know that there has been a surge in domestic violence in Japan, just as there has been in the United States and pretty much across the world during these times of increased confinement. That was entirely predictable. If you lock women and children in with people who are their abusers, you will find more violence. And that is not a biological pathogen causing tremendous harm to people's well-being, but a social interaction, a power dynamic um, that is causing that health impact. Um, I don't know what the situation is in other kinds of congregate settings like prisons, um, but I would imagine that the rates of COVID in Japan in prisons are higher. Of course, Japan doesn't have as many prisoners as we do in the United States, which we have the largest incarcerated population in the world 
and we know that uh, prisons are have much much higher rates of transmission um, and there are other congregate settings that both presenters mentioned uh, for nursing homes although there's much more long-term care at home in Japan than there is in the United States as well as uh, psychiatric institutions etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so uh, Let's see, I want to go to, I, I want to make a point about the resource allocation decisions that were highlighted in Erica's presentation uh, and healthcare capacity. Because the way healthcare systems are structured overall, whether there are centralized decisions and uh, fair, financing that has pooled financing for healthcare, whether there is explicit priority setting from the get-go for universal health coverage, which there is in Japan, but again, not in the United States, has a lot to do with how then those crisis standards of care emerge. The, the, the need for crisis standards of care in this country, which is the richest country on the planet, uh, emerges because we did not have centralized guidance from the national government or from the state government, really. Um, we did not have, what states were bidding against each other for uh, personal protective equipment and other kinds of medical equipment. Um, which, of course, is a crazy way to manage in a pandemic. So that those that, that things got so bad that crisis standards of care would have to be triggered is a reflection of how bad the planning and decision making was along the way, upstream. So yes, I think it's important to analyze the criteria that are used in crisis standards and whether people who are most likely to be affected have a voice in the decision making, whether people who have disabilities, for example, may be discriminated against, racial and ethnic minorities who face underlying health inequities may be discriminated against, but it's also important to understand that those crisis standards of care reflect failures all along the way. Um, and I think the, the last um, thing that I'm going to emphasize, which is something that was implicit, I think, in both of the presentations, is that COVID-19 is such a sweeping pandemic. And it really will not be resolved until everybody is protected, not just in rich Japan and rich the United States, but all over the world. And I think that countries like Japan and the US have particular obligations to see that, for example, the allocation of uh, therapies and eventual vaccine is equitable. Um, this pandemic is largely a result of deeply, deeply embedded inequities in global health, as well as neoliberal inequities baked into economies. Um, and I think we need to consider that moving forward and what are government responsibilities to, to, re, to not just sort of crumbs of international assistance and cooperation, but really a far more robust global public investment and solidarity moving forward. Um, so I will stop there and I hope that we can have an active conversation with the audience. So the questions I assume will be in the chat, is that correct? So I don't see any questions in the chat. Cooney, are there? 
Harold, sorry. Have we received any questions from the audience? Uh, no, not so far. Uh, okay. Um, well, well, why don't we, um, why don't I ask uh, each of the panelists then a question? While we encourage people in the audience to uh, submit questions. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Ashir. So uh, thank you very much for uh, very valuable questions and comments. And um, so, uh, but it is a little bit difficult for me to answer the whole question. And then, um, so especially the uh, regarding the global governance of the health, that is regarding on the first question. And then, so I, uh, I have enough ability to answer the this question now. So, but, um, so I would like to ask you <laughs> the first question. So, uh, what do you think about the the global government's health and including the device, the IHL in the future? So, what is uh, uh, what is necessary to uh, consider about the uh, develop the global uh, governance of health or global health law? Uh, so I think it's a somewhat involved um, question. I am on the Global Health Law Consortium, and we have explored the need to revise the international health regulations in a number of specific ways, mm -hmm. uh, uh, including having a more definite um, dispute resolution mechanism and expanding the number of conditions that it addresses and specifying more, for example, under Article 44, where it is suggested that um, uh, wealthy governments contribute to shoring up the core health capacities of uh, lower income countries. But I think that, the, that, that what needs to happen goes far beyond a revising the international health regulations because we've seen that um, uh, you know clearly it, it is disgraceful that the United States has withdrawn from the World Health Organization but the World Health Organization and Gavi and CEPI which are dealing with the research and development and uh, all ultimately distribution of a vaccine are not really um, fit for purpose in today's world. So I think we need to rethink uh, financing for these organizations and accountability mechanisms. Um, and, I, and that may seem quite um, high in the sky aspirational, but the nature of this pandemic is so extraordinarily sweeping that I think we need to grab on to the, the, the possibility to really inject some kind of transformation into global institutions. We saw that after HIV AIDS, a number of new global institutions were created. And I think it would be a, a really a missed opportunity if we did not uh, reflect and uh, alter institutions after this pandemic. I, I see a question about the right to health. If the constitu constitutional amendment in the US will be helpful or necessary to secure the right to health. I, this is about the U.S. question, but we have this great uh, law scholars here, so I think I should let you talk about it. Uh, so there will not be a constitutional amendment that enshrines the right to health in the United States. Right now we have a uh, regime in power that is trying to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, which is not universal health coverage, but is the closest thing that we have come to trying to expand coverage. Um, 
Uh, so that is just not going to happen in the United States. Uh, there are a lot of things that we could do better. And with another uh, government in power, I think that the healthcare system will be uh, modified significantly. But um, we are plagued by the rent seeking interests in health, insurance and pharmaceutical industries are very big lobbyists in the United States. And it's a huge um, healthcare industrial complex, which is um, not in the public interest. We spend a lot of money on our healthcare and it produces very poor and very unequal results. So, so there is a question saying, is there any blaming toward Bukan Wohan in Japan? However, uh, so I, I have the courses on the uh, human rights and health and human rights at university and uh, we dis uh, we uh, uh, go out the community to uh, the uh, grasp the actual condition of the people's life and in the relation to the system and then so we discuss about the human rights topics and uh, referring to the actual people's life and so such a uh, discussion and discourse is very uh, effective to enhance the students uh, uh, recognize on the health and human rights and also uh, regarding the other municipalities uh, situations so I talked about the Tokyo and Okinawa Gifu uh, said uh, amended their uh, ordinances uh, on the COVID-19 and uh, listen to the other uh, municipality to uh, uh, municipalities are prepared to amend their uh, the law and so for example the Mie prefecture hmm. other questions I think it might be time to wrap oh. up um, uh, now it's we're after 10 so uh, first of all, I wanted to thank um, the U.S.-Japan Research Institute again, as well as both of our tremendous panelists and the audience for tuning in. There are lots of webinars, and I think the um, information as well as the comparisons have been really fruitful. Um, I also wanted to leave you with, I think from both of the panelists, what comes through is that it is so clearly in COVID is that health and public health is, is not just a technical matter for uh, medical scientists or uh, it is a matter of human rights and the quality of democracy that we have in our countries. And ultimately how we get beyond the COVID-19 pandemic will depend on how we consider health systems as social institutions in our democracies, how we um, reorganize those institutional arrangements and make sure that they are inclusive of all people. Um, and that's, those are lessons that will are, be hard to take forward but if we don't do so, this is not going to be the last pandemic that the world faces or the last crisis. So I think it's really imperative to have more conversations like this in which, which trigger collective reflection on moving forward. Um, so thank you again for tuning in and to um, both to Kuko and Erico and the Institute. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are out of time, so yeah, thanks again and uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.